a little book tube. I went back to the Brattle bookshop first thing this morning. I had an appointment long before the Brattle was open, and I got myself through the appointment by promising myself a trip to the Brattle when the appointment was done. Uh, and so I went. Uh, first thing, there was nobody there, and I was able to just have all the elbow room in the world. Those of you who are new to the channel, there are there are quite a few of you who are new to the channel. Uh, the Brattle is a used bookstore in the heart of downtown Boston. They are fantastic. I have been going there forever. Uh, it's three stories of uh, hardcover and paperback books, collectible books, general interest books, all reasonably priced, all with a great amount of turnover so that you get something new there almost literally every day. And in addition to that, that'd be good enough, but in addition to that, there's a sale lot next door full of carts and shelves of bargain books, $1, $3, and $5. Uh, not the usual two or three carts like that that, that uh, used bookstores will sometimes have, but a whole lot, the, the, the floor space of an entire shop full of thousands of these things. Um, and I usually spend my time hunting out in the sale lot and I did today was no exception it was nice and cool it was lovely so uh, I went there and I browsed to my heart's content and I have some books to show you as a result uh, we'll start off with this old thing this is from the 1950s I believe uh, it, judging from the page discoloration uh, yeah 1952 uh, I've had this book a number of times before I absolutely love it I always get rid of it I always give it away to people or it falls apart on me it's not tremendously durably made and I'm pretty sure it never had a hardcover so I this could fall apart on me too but I'm gonna read it the hell out of it anyway this is uh edited by Alfred Stafford and it's the wonderful world of books and it's just it's got all these these uh, these cute uh little spot illustrations all throughout uh, but it's full of yeah I know, I know two people reading it's full of uh, essays and, and articles on the world of books, what, what, how wonderful it is to read them, how they can change your life, what they're like to sell, what they're like to collect. Uh, one piece on, uh, by Raymond Walters on how to review a book. <laughs> uh, and tons of others. Books for everyone. Libraries are for you. There's a whole section of great pieces, mid-century pieces, on the, the glory of public libraries. Uh, how books can broaden your mind, how they can make you a better citizen, all that sort of thing. I have read pieces, uh, not the whole of it, but I have read pieces in this book hundreds of times. I've read everything in here many, many times. I've had this co uh, this book many times, and it just never holds together. It's just an, a, a battered old paperback of a type that used to be made by the bushel. Uh, and though you can't tell on this video, it is absolutely steeped in old book smell. This is going to be the first thing that I read of, of the batch that I got. In fact, I was reading chunks of it on the way on the way back here. Favorite bits and pieces. That piece about book reviewing is very simple, but very entertaining. And there's another piece on uh, who is it by? There's a terrific piece in here on the resurgence of books for the millions. Uh, I don't Make friends with your bookseller. <laughs> Getting your books. Parents, teachers, and libraries. We need a library. Books for the blind. Oh, here it is. Uh, Richard Crone did a book, Good Reading for the Millions. Uh, an essay, Good Reading for the Millions. And it's 80 years old, and it's still fantastic to read. I just love it. I, this is just a blast from the past. There are aspects of the book world that are reflected in this book, many aspects that don't exist anymore. Uh, but uh, this is the book world that I love and that I know intimately. So so I grabbed it. Of course, I would have grabbed it anyway. Uh, the same thing with this next one. I've had this next one many times. I've had many copies of it. I have copies of it now. But I do not pass up a mass market paperback of it because I don't believe the mass market paperbacks have an infinite lifespan. I think they are declining. But I don't think you'll be seeing these forever. So I just grabbed them anyway. It's a matter of stockpiling. This is the best of Cordwain or Smith. Uh, with a Daryl K. Sweet cover, that is all of the, uh, some of the great characters of Cord Rainer Smith. That man with a device on his chest is a scanner. Uh, that the that is Lost Samel in her dress. This is, and this of course right here, the road is Alpha Ralpha Boulevard, and those are all taken from the short stories in this book, which has not only short stories but uh, uh, a timeline of Cord Rainer Smith's instrumentality of mankind stories. They're all linked and in, in a future that he imagined. It doesn't stress it much. You mean 
you can read any of these stories independent of any of the others. Uh, this is part of Del Rey's best of series. They did a whole bunch of these on a whole bunch of science fiction authors. I saw a whole bunch of them today, uh, including the old Del Rey best of uh, of John Campbell, the the great science fiction editor and science fiction short story writer who uh, was a racist, and because it's the 21st century, that means you can't read his books. His, his books aren't racist, but it doesn't matter. It, in his personal life, in his house in suburban Connecticut, he had opinions that you don't like, and so you can't read them anymore. No one will ever reprint the best of Cordwainer Smith or anything like that. And no one will ever write about him in a book except to condemn him, or they themselves will be condemned. It doesn't matter the... As I'm not, what I mentioned on this channel many times before that the that old the old saw about separating the art from the artist is completely gone in the 21st century. It has been replaced with directly equate the art with the artist. And if you don't like the politics of the artist, then scorn the book, no matter what it is. Uh, but Cord Rainer Smith was a little bit easier pill to swallow, and by far the most talented writer in this whole best of series by far he is great he wrote a novel called Norstralia that is also set in the instrumentality of mankind and that is a science fiction classic that science fiction fans haven't read and his short stories are even better this this collection starts with scanners live in vain a great science fiction short story and it moves on from there to uh the ballad of lost samel and alpha ralpha boulevard and a bunch of other things it's, he's a tremendous tremendous writer uh and i have copy a couple of copies of the best of Cordrainer smith and exactly this cover but I grab it anyway. I uh, just, I just grab it anyway, because one of the things, one of the things that's a little traumatic about the Brattle sale lot, is that at the back of it, discreetly hidden behind a chain link fence, is a dumpster. And that's where the books end up, that aren't bought. They don't. It's not like they go anywhere else. They get, they get destroyed, after that. And I, I always, when I see a book like this, the best of Cordrainer Smith, I always worry that it's just going to get destroyed. When If I have it on my shelf, I can give it away or enjoy it, that sort of thing. Uh, then this next one is from Chronicle Books. They did a whole series of these years and years ago, these old uh, little hard, gift hardcovers with sepia tone covers of different locations, historical writings excerpted from different locations. They did one for old Hong Kong, old Cairo. And they did one for Venice, of course, and I, I, I've had it on and off. But every time I've seen those old volumes of the Brattle, I've thought, well, you know, you don't really want old Cairo or old Hong Kong or whatever. You would get the old Venice volume if, they, if you ever saw it. And I did. I saw it today. Uh, I used to, those of you who are new to the channel, I used to live in Venice. And I dearly, dearly love it. It's my second favorite place on earth. Uh, and this has excerpts from Thomas Mann, Edith Wharton, Orson Welles, Casanova, uh, John Paul Sartre, a bunch of other people. Uh, and it's these, it's this little, uh, you know, stocking stuffer book in, uh, on sepia tone pages. Uh, it's, it'll just go in my, on my Venice shelf. I have a shelf of Venice books. I have more than one shelf of Venice books. It'll just go on there, uh, for the, the choices that are on there. Uh, and then this next one is a series that I really like. Uh, I mentioned it before, the Viking Portable Library series. They are terrific. I used to have tons and tons of them. I don't anymore. Uh, for a while, like, they were a project of Vikings. They came out with these uh, fat, well-stuffed paperbacks uh, anthologizing all the bits and, and notable pieces from their target audiences, and there were tons of them. There were great volumes. The Viking Portable Renaissance Reader, the Viking Portable Medieval Reader that had selections that you wouldn't find anywhere else. They, they uh, And also... Viking Portable Library editions for famous authors. Um, everybody from Tolstoy all the way forward. And uh, I found one today. I found a Viking Portable Library today of Stephen Crane. I've had the Viking Portable Stephen Crane in the past before, but the difference here is that this is a hardcover with a dust jacket. Uh, and I, I always have to remind myself that I did once upon a time know that all of the Viking Portables came in hardcovers with dust jackets. This isn't a hardcover that was made of a paperback in order for it to be used in a school. This was this is actually just an, an ordinary um, hardcover for sale. 
and and it's the best collection of Stephen Crane that I'll that I'll get. So I grabbed it. <laughs> uh, then this next one is also uh, a hardcover of a classic, and it has a story behind it. Uh, this is the Barnes and Noble hardcover classic of the histories of Herodotus. And then this. The Barnes Noble, these Barnes Noble hardcover editions of their classics are the opposite number from the paperback editions of the, the paperback Barnes and Noble classics are really cheap, in every sense of the word. They're no, they're inexpensive and they're also poorly made, uh, and ugly. So you know they're a natural thing for students to gravitate towards because they'll cost you four dollars, but they're not worth keeping. Usually they're not worth keeping. Usually they're some bargain basement reprinted essay as an introduction and terrible physical quality one drop of glue along a trade paperback spine meaning it's not going to last a, a serious rereading you're not it's going to fall apart on you the hardcovers were a different story they're they're made of lightweight material and they have the, the deckled edges that i know that booktube loves uh and tasteful covers i have a couple in this room i have the the barnes for instance the barnes and noble um hardcover classic of vanity fair is lovely and, and here is the, the histories of Herodotus, and this is a translation that I don't have in any other format. This was taken up by the Barnes & Noble Classics series. The translation is by Donald Leitner, L-A-T-E-I-N-E-R. Uh, and it, it comes with a story uh, from when I worked at Barnes & Noble. I worked at the, uh, the downtown Boston Barnes & Noble when it still existed forever and ever, for, a lot, for 20 years. And I had an inf there was an information desk at the back of the first floor, big big wood information desk, a huge clock behind it, uh, and me, <laughs> and me as well. The other fixture at that desk was me. I was there all the time. Uh, and I had slews of customers, and I loved it. That was my favorite thing to do. I never went near the registers. I never did any kind of section upkeep or busy work. I was busy at my information desk answering questions about books and making recommendations. As one manager used to say, turning a $5 customer into a $100 customer without fail and without much trouble. <laughs> As you, if you, you know, if you watch this channel, I can be dangerous to a book buying budget. Uh, and one day, when I was at my information desk, a woman came up and asked me if we had the Barnes & Noble edition of uh, the Barnes & Noble trade paperback, the Barnes & Noble paperback of the histories of Herodotus. And naturally, my eyes lit up. I was always happy when any customer wanted a copy of any of my favorite authors, no matter what edition they wanted. Uh, I, I saved a lot of time at the information desk because I very seldom needed to look anything up. I, and so I told her, yes, we do have the Barnes & Noble edition of uh, the Susan Herodotus, and I can take you right to it. Uh, and as we were walking there uh, to the section, she said, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like uh, you can't be this enthusiastic about everything. It sounds like you're familiar with the histories of Herodotus. And I said, I am indeed. If you're thinking about reading it for the first time, you're going to have a blast if you get used to it. If you get on Herodotus's wavelength, you're going to love it. Absolutely love it. Absolutely fantastic book. Every bit as alive and entertaining and interesting and thought-provoking now as it was 3,000 years ago. And she, she said, my, my. Well, I don't, I don't get that kind of reaction very often in a bookstore. That should have been my first clue to what she was up to. She said, well, what about this Barnes & Noble edition by Donald Leitner? Does, do you like the edition? Do you like the translation? He did the translation and the introduction and the notes. It's all rather elaborate. Uh, when it comes time for you to recommend a translation of Herodotus, do you, do you ever recommend this translation? And I, uh, we were going up the escalator, and I was, I was loving it. I was so enthused about these questions that I wasn't thinking about why she was asking them. I, I, so I started, I launched off on, you know, well, there's Rawlinson. But he's, he's a century old, and he shows it. He has a rolling kind of magisteri to, uh, magisterial tone to him, but it's probably not the translation that anybody wants today, and he's not in print anymore anyway. Then there's Aubrey de Selincourt for Penguin Classics, and he is very, very uh, approachable, conversational even. And although that is a selling point, it isn't always the note that Herodotus is striking. De Selincourt imposes that on, on Herodotus in some places, and some people might not trust that. They might not like it. Whereas I have read the Leitner translation, and it's excellent. It's, it's thoroughly conversational, but it's, it's also very heavily noted. It's very heavily scholarly in a way that Herodotus would have approved of. He would not, want, he would not have wanted his histories to be incomprehensible to a later age simply by virtue of some editor not providing the right footnote. And Leitner's footnotes are great all throughout. And his introduction is great. So 
in, in terms of a, a very cheap paperback, you can't go wrong with this edition. I wasn't selling her the hardcover. I didn't know that the hardcover existed, really, until today. I'm sure I've seen it, uh, but I'd forgotten. The paperback, though, I recognized from a mile away. And uh, we found the book, and she took it, and, and uh, as she was about to, we got, went back down to my information desk, and she was about to turn to go to the registers, uh, she said, uh, well, I'm very grateful to hear all those things about Donald Leitner's translation, because I'm his wife. And I said, you scamp. <laughs> what if I hadn't liked it? What if you asked me? You didn't tell me that ahead of time. What if I didn't like it? What if I had nothing but negative things to say about it? What if I said that, you know, that somewhere in Heliconarsis, the ground is shaking because Herodotus is rolling over in his grave with the desecration this Leitner guy is doing to his work? What, what, what would have happened then? And she said, well, I've done this in a few bookstores, and you're the first clerk who even recognized what I was talking about. So I was willing to take that as a victory, whether you liked it or not. The fact that you liked it, icing on the cake. <laughs> it reminded me of a time years before that when I was at my information desk at that same bookstore and a customer came up and said, do you have the novels of Spider Robinson? An old uh, science fiction author, Callahan's Cross Time Saloon and uh, Time Travel is Strictly Cash and all that stuff. And I, I, my custom was always, the store's policy was also take the customer to the book. Don't just tell them where it is. But that was often observed in the breach. I always took the customer to the book because that gave me walking time to talk to them about the book and a bunch of other books. Uh, and that made my day. That was why I was there, uh, accepting pee on wages. That was why I was at that job for so long, specifically for those walks. And as we were walking over to, to Spider, I had a big collection of Spider Robinson in the science fiction section. I was, as we were walking over there, I, the, the customer said, well, you know, do you get any call for him? Do you like him? Is he any good? And I said, yes, he's quite good. He's funny, but he's not cheap funny. He's, it, it's intelligent funny. He earns the smiles that he gets from you. And not a lot of funny science fiction authors do that. In fact, some of the most prominent ones don't. They just do slapstick. And you'll either laugh or you won't, but they, have, they aren't really trying to earn anything. And when we got to the books, sure enough, uh, the, the customer was Spider Robinson. And I said the same thing to him. I chewed him out. I said, what happened? What would have happened if I didn't like your work? We're walking all the way over there, and I didn't even know it was you. What if I'd been ragging on it the whole time? You have to sense from talking to me for even five seconds that I would have done that. I wouldn't have lied to you. He said, I took my chances. <laughs> but anyway, I, the, uh, Donald Leitner's wife and I laughed, and then she paid for the book and left. And a week later, a letter came to that, to that store addressed to me. Uh... And I, I opened it at the information desk, and it was a picture of her husband holding up his two books, because he also did Thucydides for Barnes & Noble. He was holding them both up, and he had the most mischievous grin on his face. <laughs> I don't know if that means that he was in on the sting or not, but one way or another, I kept that picture. Uh, and I, I have longed for this translation. I just stopped myself from getting it because those Barnes & Noble trade paperbacks aren't worth having in your library. Just just physically, as physical products, they aren't. But this very much is. I'll, I'll patch up that little rip on the top of the cover and keep this as a Herodotus. Absolutely, this is a translation that I want to keep. I may even work it into a reread in October. It's been a while since I've read Herodotus from start to back. I haven't done that, in fact, since Tom Holland's translation of Herodotus, which I, I read and then reread a couple of times in order to review it for the quarterly conversation. Uh, I, it's been that long, and that's been a long time, so it's probably due for a reread. Instead of just going back to Aubrey de Salincourt over and over again, why not go back to this? So I was happy to find it. Uh, then this next one, uh, as you can see, is Blue-Eyed Child of Fortune. <sighs> Don't ever reach the age of 28, book two. Your mind starts to go. I was talking the other day uh, about... <laughs> about Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. I was talking about Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain with... Uh, with Mark, with Mark Richardson and Richardson Reese, obviously, since uh, Mark grew up with Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain and has lived in many of the same houses as he has, and I think has him in the basement of his current house. Uh, uh, Chamberlain was, in a minor way, a pivotal figure in the American Civil War, and when we were talking, when we were done talking about him, I said there's a great book about him called Blue-Eyed Child of Fortune. Of course, the Blue-Eyed Child of Fortune is about Robert Gould Shaw, not about Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. This in the Hands of Providence is the book about Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. And as soon as I realized, there are a couple of you pointed it out in the comments field, uh, and uh, as soon as I realized that, I felt like a horse's patoot. 
And I actually thought about, you know, going into the comments field and correcting myself or maybe making a video correcting myself. And then I thought, the Brattle will provide. We, Mark and I invoked Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, so the Brattle will give me this book. It will put it, this book in my path. This is a trade paperback. I'm perfectly happy with that. Uh, I haven't read this book in a long time, and it's terrific. It's really, really good. Tell you Chamberlain's story, not only the, that pivotal moment, but the long story before then, with him as a teacher and growing up, and the long story after that. Uh, he lived for a long time. He lived to be an old man. So, uh, <laughs> so the book is this. It's In the Hands of Providence. It is not Blue-Eyed Child of Fortune. They are both great books about minor American Civil War figures. Uh, and then the last book is also a biography. It's a great big thing by a guy who used to be famous. This is J.A. Hamilton's book on George Meredith, uh, his life and art in anecdote and criticism. Tons and tons of artwork in this thing. This is from, I think, 1910 or something like that. Uh, Hamilton wrote a biography of Robert Louis Stevenson. He also wrote a book of Stephen Sonniana that was really good. And a couple of others. He wrote a couple of other literary biographies. He wrote a lot of other literary stuff, too. He was a literary poobah. He's totally forgotten today. And that makes this book uh, uh, perfectly apropos, because so is Meredith. I don't have any idea why. But George Meredith is completely forgotten. No one, no one knows him. No one reads his stuff. This has the, the onion skin divider there between the, uh, the picture and the title page. There is, there is our author. Uh, he is totally forgotten as a novelist, as a critic, as a literary figure of any kind. That's a shame, because his stuff is great. Just great. Um, and I, because he's totally forgotten, I mean, he's not taught in schools, no one reads him for pleasure. I don't get it. I really don't. Uh, he wrote one book that is widely regarded as his masterpiece, uh, but even that isn't assigned at schools anymore, isn't taught. He used to have a Norton critical edition. The egoist, but I don't, I don't know that, it, that that exists anymore, and there are no popular editions of this author at all. And that's the kiss of death right there. If you're not taught in schools and there's no popular edition of your work for a person to stumble across in a bookstore, then good luck finding an audience in the next generation. Uh, so I don't think that George Meredith will ever be the subject of a modern biography. You're pretty much going to have to find an old style thing like this. But I am, I this still has coloring in the letters for Pete's sake, and it's full of. Uh, of illustrations, not only pictures from his books, but also uh, photographs, old black and white photographs of some of the key locations in his life. Uh, so it's going to be a joy to, Meredith had a fascinating life, and this is full of excerpts from his work. So it's going to be fascinating to read anyway. So that, that was my, uh, this plus a few, a few things that I'm not showing, a few gifts and things like that, was my Brattle trip. We have an old biography of George Meredith. Uh, who is a literary titan who's now forgotten, and the biography is by a literary titan who's now forgotten. We have In the Hands of Providence, which is not the blue-eyed child of fortune. How are we doing for light? There we go. We have uh, Donald Leitner's translation of Herodotus. Uh, if I can, if this showed up, maybe the same person sold the brattle his translation of Thucydides, that would be great. If I can have both of them, that would be wonderful. We have a Viking portable library edition of Stephen Crane in a hardcover with a dust jacket, so that can go right in this room. Uh, we have one of these old Chronicle book uh, gift items of uh, Venice. We have the mass market paperback of the best of Cordwainer Smith, uh, an, a science fiction writer that if you like science fiction, you should make his acquaintance. You really should. Uh, and lastly, the wonderful world of books, which is, despite all the goodies on this pile, this is going to get my attention first. Maybe not all the way through, but, uh, but in bits and pieces, certainly, because there's so much wonderful stuff in it. Just so many wonderful, spirited, and intelligent, articulate mid-century calls to read, to love reading the wonderful world, the uh, the the adventure of it, the sheer self-reinvention of reading. I, there's, I, I never tire of reading stuff like that, and these don't have the tone of uh, unearned, ignorant cynicism that such a book would have in the 21st century, even if it had the best of intentions. The, in the 21st century, you cannot escape the now universal fad of unearned, cheap, stupid, off-the-cuff cynicism. That gets a little tiring to read uh, for me. <laughs> and this won't have it. This will have the, uh, the can-do spirit of the, of the mid-20th century instead. I've read some of these essays so many times that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read them again anyway. Um, so that's it. That was my, my post-quarantine brattle trip. I don't know when I'll be back to the brattle. Uh, but if I, 
if I go back, I'm sure that I will get books. And if I do, you'll be the first to know about it. Uh, so I'm going to wrap this up for now. Uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.